It's the place where the bright lights are so much brighter and the impossibly imposing is commonplace. Las Vegas, the most spectacular, the most expensive piece of desert real estate on earth. People here in America's fastest living, fastest growing city might think they've seen it all. The Royal Air Force are about to prove them wrong. Squadron leader Paul Day from Sunderland is the world's leading authority on Spitfires. Earlier this year, he was invited to take part in America's biggest ever air show, a celebration of 50 years of the United States Air Force. The only condition, one of the Spitfires he pilots as officer commanding the Battle of Britain Memorial flight came to. It's, I'm tempted to say, an almost perfect thing. It's. It's got exactly the right blend, given its, given its years. So it's not a modern fighter, but its power to weight ratio is as much as you want. But more than that, the harmonization of its controls, either the way things work left, right, up, down, and side to side, are all in perfect balance. You can fly it quite happily with one finger and get quite significant amounts of cheap. The Americans, uh, before the official entry of uh, the United States into the war, did serve in considerable numbers in the Royal Air Force, and so it's entirely appropriate on their 50th birthday that we should uh, acknowledge that fact. The Americans flew Spitfires in what were known as Eagle Squadrons, which is why the Spit that's destined to cross the Atlantic, in a mission its designers would never have thought possible, has an American emblem on its fuselage absolutely is a living legend and it lives up to its mystique um, and no two ways about it. I cannot conceive, given that my number of types in aviation is relatively small, I just cannot conceive of anything that would give me more pleasure to fly. But this living legend, the RAF's only surviving Mark V, has to undergo a transformation before it can fly to Nellis Air Force Base just outside Las Vegas. The warrior that survived years of aerial combat is about to be grounded. What's more, here, at the home of the Joint Air Transport Establishment, the very people who spend their working lives keeping the Spitfire in one piece have to dismantle it. Now, whether we use battens and plywood over the top, we do need something. The reason why, because we've got nets which are joined together, triple nets which are joined together, with all those big heavy hooks on it. I'm concerned about scratching and damaging the wings. It's never been taken apart uh, to this degree and put inside a Hercules aircraft before. A fax came through to our task coordinator in the headquarters saying, please, can you do this job? And the job was take a Spitfire from here to America. So we get some drawings of the Spitfire. We look at it as a scale drawing and said, well, physically, will it fit in the first place? And we thought, well, yes, if we do the following, take the wings off, take the tail off, take the propellers off and the wheels off, yes, it can fit. And then we look at ways of how best to protect it and to load it. And we decided on, on a palletization approach. And that's how we did it. I want to be able to strain this. Right, you tell me where you want them. OK. Oh, well, Can you combine with... that with your cross bracing, then? Or will it... Or you do it separate? You don't want to do it with your tie bracing, Would there be any cross bracing if we had the chains on them? Or do you reckon no, we can no, get it? We're, we're overdoing it. Um, so Let me we... sit down and do some sums. Yeah. And I'll come back to you whether I want cross bracing or independent. So I think the thing that makes it unusual is the fact that it's so unique as an aircraft. And we all, when it flew in here, everybody thought, wow, what a fantastic aircraft. Uh, historically, we're, we're aware of its historical significance and also its fragility. It's the only one there is. We can't break it, we can't damage it. And that's the thing that's causing us the challenge, is that we've really got to make sure that we don't scratch it at all. Um, we, we can't replace it if we ever we damaged it.
Right, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking out the seven spar bolts, removing those, and then hopefully we should take the wing away. This is my first time. <laughs> I'm petrified. <laughs> I don't want to break anything. <laughs> I'm glad that's going to turn this upside down. <laughs> we, won't, we won't today, but we'll it off. Yeah. Right, can you take her out of the baggy, please? Can we go up? Just it down, mate. Well, it's... It's got to go on. Just serve it. This. That's fine. This is quite an unusual enterprise because normally the Back Britain Memorial Flight Aircraft actually stay within this country or in anywhere where they're able to go under their own steam. Uh, it's most unusual to actually have to take an aeroplane apart and move it anywhere. Um, in that respect, this is uh, probably a unique experience. Right, that's it. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. That's okay. fine, that's awesome. it. The choice of this aircraft uh, was made primarily because it is a, a very representative aircraft of the aircraft that were operated by 71 Squadron, the Eagle Squadron, during the Second World War. Um, it's a Spitfire Mike 5B, and as I say, it's exactly the, the representative of the type that was used at that time. But it's a temporary indignity for the old aircraft because this is the only way it will fit inside a Hercules transport for its first ever trip across the Atlantic. Under its own power, the Spit would run out of fuel somewhere wet and west of Ireland. Right, going on to the itinerary, gents. The Hercules has been delivered by a Jake crew on Friday, Friday 11th, departing line at 10.30 Zulu, and into here half an hour later. It's then staying here Friday, Saturday, and we depart Sunday. As you see, all times Zulu, we depart at 13.0700. OK? We go via Gander for a refueling stop, 90 minutes, and on to Boston. We night stop Boston, and then to Nellis, which is LSV. OK? And that's where VDMF adds you and this Spitfire. That's where you get off. We don't have much time on our hands to get the Spitfire offloaded. We need those pallets off you for our next task. So what's happening, we're take, looking to take the Spitfire off the pallets, dump it on the ground on the cradles. We need those pallets back on the aircraft for our next task, which, if you read on, is Roosevelt Loads in Puerto Rico we're going to go down there to collect a, a Royal Naval Tyne engine. OK, gents. Let's do it. We do this quite regularly uh, with lots of other aircraft, uh, be it hundred jets, be it helicopters. Our problem with this Spitfire is to make sure that it balances in the aircraft without causing any stress to the aircraft. There is absolutely no room for error. Every single piece of the Spitfire has its own specially made container. It's all measured because there's not that much space to spare inside the Hercules. The unknown quantity is the weight. There are no textbooks to tell you how heavy a Spitfire is minus most of its airframe. After all, you just don't dismantle pieces of aviation history and fly them across the Atlantic until now. So the scales are brought in. Blocks have been made to support the fuselage. Do you know the diameter of the inch? Oh, the dolly. That's what I thought. Yeah. Okay. Right. I can see this with that block. 
real start for 10 minutes. Yeah. Wait until we get to the other couple of inches and then adjust it. Can you see that? When we were about the 8 bar, we'll start to position it. If it's going in, baggy. Slowly. Alright, yeah. okay, you're in. Down. Perfect. Okay. The tail hasn't come up. Now for the weigh-in with the computer readout. Oh well, that's the way to do everything. And now all those careful calculations are being put to the test. Got to within about an inch. If anything, you're probably being over fussy, but that's where you should be. Clear the transit of the Bryce Control Zone at 3,000 feet off Bryce QFE 1019. You are coordinated against traffic in the radar instrument pattern, not above 2,500 feet. It's very, very tight with all the Battle of Britain and Royal Flight Engineers, all their equipment, plus the Spitfire itself. That's all our equipment as well. There is not much space left uh, for the passengers, of which there's 16 of them. So it's going to be a really tight, snug fit. Next stop, the Nevada desert. And one consolation of travelling for long hours in an aeroplane that lacks just about every creature comfort is that you can at least enjoy the scenery. This is a Hercules eye view of the Colorado River and the Grand Canyon. With the Atlantic behind them, they arrive in the desert. Very nice shot of the They did cross two one right for Bravo. This is where we, uh, we do the opposite of what we did at Bryce Norton now. This is where we try and put it all back together again and hopefully not end up with too many washers left over. Sort of makes you want to get a white scarf and uh, throw it around your neck. We're taking off is easy. Put it back on. We've got to be careful of all the different bits and pieces that have been disconnected to make sure it goes back together properly. Um, we've also got to get the bolts in the right order, and uh, hopefully it will all go together okay. Each bolt goes in its own hole because you know, of the, the way that they're machined. They can only fit in one place. You put him in, and then we'll get the nuts on the back of those. Uh... Cosmetically, it looks like the wings are on, but uh, this is just a start, really. Um, we've got the rear attachment bolt to fit. Uh, once that is on, then the mechanical assembly of the wing is complete. Then all we've got is uh, all the services that go through the wing and the electrical connections, speedo connections, that sort of stuff. It's good to see a piece of history that uh, eventually helped win the war, and good to see it coming together real nicely here. I think it's going to put on a great show. Oh, I, somebody yeah. said, you know, have a go. How much would it cost me? <laughs> I think you'd, you'd pay for that. I, oh, yes. On this one, yes. 
this one has uh, a lot of history, romance. Uh, of course, I've read some about the Battle of Britain, where this played an extremely important part. Uh, uh, we're just writing history with the F-16, so uh, it's uh, it's sleek and it, it looks that de delicate, but actually it's quite uh, quite healthy as is this thing. It takes uh, took a, quite a beating, I guess, and uh, still still brought the guys back. So that's the, the nice thing about it. Oh, she's beautiful. I live for this stuff. She's gorgeous. Just wanted to come out, get to look at it, get to touch it, say I did it. I'll stand back about you because this has been yeah, known yeah. to spring about. After three days of working almost around the clock, the memorial flight experts and the Spitfire are ready to leave the hangar for their debut on the airfield in searing desert heat. Well, it went together OK, a lot better than we thought. And uh, hopefully a good air test. And uh, fingers crossed, as you say, and uh, it'll be, should be serviceable. was surprised that the mighty Rolls-Royce Merlin engine started first time. It has been doing it for more than half a century. She's got a bit of temperature on it already. It's about 70 degrees, which normally you'd wait about five minutes to get that. It's normal for this heat. It's terrible. It could pose a problem when it comes to fly. If it's too hot in the day, you have to put on a lot of throttle to get all the power, be a bit underpowered in hot weather. For a man with more hours at the Spitz controls than anyone in history, that's not likely to be a problem. There are other things on his mind. There's a lot of crossbone in that at the moment. Ooh. The Spitfire is so skittish and so prone to crosswind, and I would almost say has a mind of its own at times. I mean, I've landed Spitfires in five knots straight down the runway, anticipated no problem. And for reasons which you can never explain, it suddenly starts to go sideways. Fair to say that it has the ground handling qualities of a supermarket trolley. But outside of that, uh, once it's airborne, it's, it's in a realm of its own. remember that almost children of 18 did this in a war. I mean, uh, Battle of Britain flight is here for the purpose of, if you like, memorial to those people. But really, more than that, we've got to remember that we, if you like, namby-pamby around doing air displays in uh, always in good weather, which is uh, for the benefit of the aeroplane rather than us. But on those few occasions when I've had to fly, when it's been particularly cold, I winter sort of air tests, then you actually start to experience what they experience all the time, day in, day out. And, you know, the cockpit environment is absolutely horrendous, very, very noisy. There's no heating in it whatsoever. Well, the late models did when they started to pressurize, but it really is a very basic, very uncomfortable environment even just to fly around in it under today's conditions. Um, to actually go and do the job in it, well, you're sometimes open mouth with wonderment that they actually manage to do it. It is not pleasant. The 
boys have done a magnificent job. The aeroplane is absolutely faultless. So uh, back to the pool. You could almost hear the collective sigh of relief from the memorial flight team. Although they never doubted that the Spitfire would pass its test with flying colours. By this time, other aircraft arrive for the big day. It only happens once every 50 years, so everyone who's anyone in aviation is here. I fly this airplane, same as mine was in World War II. I flew out of England in 43, 44, and 45. And you also did a little thing like breaking the sound barrier. Hmm? That wasn't so damn little. It may be your opinion, <laughs> it's not mine. They're looking back through 50 years of history. They're bound to pick out the sort of the milestones. It's a very, uh, well, I think it's a, it's a benchmark aeroplane in the world. And I think the Americans are very glad that it's here, particularly as it's an RAF aeroplane. So, so it's doubly good, yeah. And of course, the other P-51s and the um, P-38s and the Thunderbolts, because they were so significant in the United States Air Force, played a bigger part, ultimately, uh, in the United States Air Force than the Spitfire did, albeit we started it. I'll polish it. Okay, I'll polish it. He's got his No there. pictures of me polishing a Messerschmitt. There are limits. They don't make them like they used to, do they? They don't. In fact, uh, looking with you just a few moments ago, as we saw the B-2 and the SR-71 being towed in, they certainly don't. And uh, the sound of a prop is something very special indeed. The five-ship formation of the B-51 Mustangs, ladies and gentlemen. What a beautiful sight that is. General Chuck Yeager retired. Glamour Simmons and Lutz. Showtime at Nellis, a crowd of more than quarter of a million spread over an area the size of Heathrow Airport. But here, there are a lot more planes and excitement. Boy, you can see it all here today, ladies and gentlemen. development has really taken the pilot more and more and more out of the loop uh, to the point where you are to a degree assistance manager. So yeah, you can go back to the Spitfire and you can go back to real aviation.
up next, Mitch goes undercover posing as a drag queen in Baywatch Nights.